the things that I'm hearing nursing students say, say here at the student nursing convention um, that are not true about next gen NCLEX. I wrote it down because I really want to tell you guys. So just first thing is, I said this, you don't have to know the brand name and the generic names. Definitely. Case studies. Some people are saying that they had 15 case studies or they know they're going to get like seven or eight case studies. You guys know that that is not the truth. Okay. You guys know that you're going to get three, okay, three guaranteed case studies. And you may get, you can, you can hear me? Okay. Um, and you may get two or three more as pre test. Okay. Now, so the, when people say I had 10 or 17 case studies, what they're talking about is that they had an exhibit of an electronic health record and one question associated with that electronic health record. So yes, they did get a nurse's note and then they had to answer a question about it. But because it's only one question, it is not a case study. You get six questions in a block with a case study, right? So that is a misconception. So when you guys see those one questions with the doctor's notes or the medication list, that's not, that's not considered a case study. It's just a next gen question type. And you should be prepared to get next gen question types. And a lot of them, a lot of them. All right. A lot of them. So it's not unusual for you to get like 30, 40, select all that apply. Actually, you should be very, very happy if that happens because because then that means that you will be getting partial credit for some of those that you got right, okay? All right. Follow-up questions. Follow-up questions and what is the follow-up priority? Remember when you see follow-up questions, you're usually looking for something that is wrong, okay? So if a patient needs follow-up, for anything, you're trying to reinforce the correct understanding. All right. Reinforce the correct understanding. Um, nurses follow up priorities are trying to correct something that is acutely wrong with the patient. So if I have a new dressing that I just placed on a patient, my follow up priority is going to be what? If I have a new dressing, I patient has a wound. They say they have a stage three, right, wound. I put the dressing on according to the doctor's order. When I follow up with the patient, what am I going to be looking for? Where are my follow-up priorities? Okay. Follow-up priorities is going to be, uh, is there any drainage? Am I seeing drainage? Is that is that dressing clean, dry, intact? Is my patient having pain? Okay. Right. Those are your, those are how follow-up priorities work. Yeah. Bleeding. How's that dressing look? Okay. So that's follow-up priorities. And it can be, like I said, it can be very, very difficult because now this is the clinical component of next gen NCLEX. It's not asking you what does normal drainage looks like. It wants to know, do you understand the priorities of that? So the questions in the QBank that I'm writing are heavily clinical, heavily clinical, because this is how you this is how you're going to pass. And repeat test takers who may not have had clinical experience um, in a long time doing the content and then the questions is going to be very important for you. It's going to be very important. Yeah. So I, I don't want to I want to make sure you guys are not studying um, the old way. Honestly, I want to make sure you're studying in a way that's progressive. Yes. Good job, Ruth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, uh, we had already been talking 30 minutes. I did not mean to keep y'all so long today. And let's go to... Mm -hmm. Let's go to Torch Syndrome. Torch Syndrome is a... Um, is a topic that I added on here. All right. All right. So torch syndrome. Mm. Is rubiola 
part of Torch syndrome. And you know, Torch is T O R C H. And this is a combination of five, five conditions that make up Torch syndrome. Is rubiola the R in Torch? What do you guys say? Okay. All right. And I'm having fun with Quick Facts. Quick Facts is fun because it, it, it puts you on the spot. And I'll probably tomorrow with the nursing students, I'll, I'll be asking them questions from this book, maybe. <laughs> all right. So all y'all that's saying, yes, y'all know that's not right. It's not rubiola. It's not rubiola. No, it's rubella, rubella, which is different from rubiola. Okay. All right. Next question is this. Mm, are the conditions in torch syndrome are the conditions in torch syndrome contagious okay are the conditions in torch syndrome contagious what do you guys think mm -hmm. thank you thank you for posting up what it is now i want to ask are they contagious all right Some people are saying yes, some people are saying no, some people are saying yes, some people are saying no. All right. Um, correct answer is, I like that. Most definitely, yes. These are contagious, for sure. So remember, in this condition, you usually are getting this or seeing these conditions in pregnancy. Okay. Pregnancy. So let me say this. Mm. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. Let me ask you this. So with torch syndrome, the O in torch stands for other infections. So the T is toxmo toxoplasmosis. The O is other symptoms. Rubella is the R. The C is is cytomegalovirus and the H is herpes simplex. So what I'm asking you is the other infections, name one other infection in pregnancy that a woman can get that will pass down to their child. No, I was like, what other things? That's what I'm asking you. What other things? I have some, I have some infections here that are in part of the clinical priorities. So, I mean, this is just a difference. Like with Quick Facts, I asked you a question, but I feel like with Next Gen Quick Facts, I'm able to take it a step diff more with the clinical priorities, okay? Oh, good job, good job. Okay, so herpes is one of them. HIV is another one, uh, not, not ectopic pregnancy. Zika a virus is one, Zika, okay? HIV, chicken pox, syphilis, or herpes, um, her hepatitis, herpes B, hepatitis B. Good job, good job, good job. Okay, that reminded me of another topic I wanted to go over, which is COVID-19. You know we got to know about COVID-19 because it's out there, all right? And so is this topic in the V2 Yes, this is the topic in the V2 because this book is part of the V2 program. My NCLEX review is this book plus V2 plus the question bank. That's my whole that's my whole program. And I'm out here with other NCLEX reviews, y'all, and nobody is doing the price that Remar. I mean, these these other NCLEX reviews is at this convention center are hundreds, a hundreds of dollars. I don't gotta say no names. I don't gotta say no names. All right, let's go over COVID-19, please. First question, COVID-19, you ready? COVID-19, is it a virus or a bacterial infection? Here we go. COVID-19, quick fingers, quick fingers. Is it a viral or a bacterial infection? Oh, y'all do it. 
Good job. It is. It is a virus. Of course, y'all know COVID-19 is a virus. Okay, let me ask you this. Mm, give me the uh give me the isolation precaution for COVID-19. Now, you know it's changed. You know when it first came out, you had to put on everything. But now Somebody come in the hospital and they say they got COVID-19. What is the nurse supposed to put on? Uh, no, make sure, make sure you know it's not both. It is going to be, um, it's just a virus. It's just a virus. It's not a bacteria. Thank God it's not a bacterial infection. <sighs> mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm asking about the appropriate isolation for COVID-19. Correct answer. Okay. Per CDC, Center for Disease Control, is droplet, droplet precautions, okay? Droplet precautions. So that means in a disaster, a person with COVID-19 can have a roommate, okay? Mm, let me ask you this. Can COVID-19... Can a person have COVID-19 and have no symptoms? Is that a thing? Can a person with COVID-19 have zero symptoms? What do you guys say? I'm glad you guys are participating so much. This is, uh, this is amazing. Over 600 nurses right now studying. And I am exhausted, but this is just giving me so much energy to see y'all putting these comments on the screen. I asked the question, can a person with COVID-19 have no symptoms? And y'all are all on one accord. Oh, no, 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 there's somebody who said no. Everybody else is saying yes, asymptomatic. And that is true. Yes, without symptoms. Isn't that something? Some people just blessed. When I had COVID-19, Lord, I can hardly hold my head up. It was the worst. Okay. Ooh. Mm. What should I say? Can a COVID-19 infection occur if an infected person touches the surface and another person touches that same surface? Let me ask you that. Can COVID-19 spread from infected surfaces? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Good job. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. It's very contagious like that. OK, let's talk about um, some COVID. Let's talk about some COVID um, responses. So COVID can put a person at risk for what circulatory mm, Disease. Oh, I shouldn't say disease. Um, because it's hypercoagulable, it increases the risk of what? COVID-19. And honestly, it's been found, it's really interesting to see um, people who pass away for, from COVID, when they do an autopsy, they show like these long, huge what that people get. Yes, yes. DVTs, blood clots, pulmonary embolisms. COVID does that to people's circulatory system where they get these blood clots. And so you think they're fine on the outside because they're up talking and their oxygenation saturation is pretty decent. And then they experience a blood clot that travels to their lungs, you know? And so um, that is something that we need to know, that we need to know. What do we call conditions that develop after an acute COVID uh, infection? What is, what is that group called? I'm not a doctor. Guess what? I'm better than a doctor. 
I'm a nurse. Ah. And I was just talking with a nurse today and she's a nurse. She's been a nurse for 28 years, longer than me. But we were talking about how um, when you're a nurse and you know your stuff, the doctors will ask you what to do. Watch. The doctors will ask you what to do. They'll ask you what to do all the time because nurses actually do what? We actually stay with the patients and we know them. All right. No. So I was I was thinking of long, long COVID, long COVID complications are um conditions that develop two months after the initial infection long covid okay all right y'all want to do some more or y'all good we've been studying for probably at least 30 minutes I need to do the top three things over again. Yeah. Oh, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm gonna out in with the top three things. Somebody say yes, please. Keep going. Somebody said, sure, I'm folding laundry. I got nothing else to do. <laughs> okay, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Oh, so deep. Okay, here we go. All right. Quick facts for NCLEX is um, the, the pediatric quick facts for NCLEX is in the file vault. It's in the file vault. Let me know if you can't get it. Okay, let's talk about the transgender client. The transgender client. Oh, you said I got nothing but time. Y'all are y'all are the best because I am. Oh, all right. The transgender client. This is a topic that I was able to. Um, I was able to talk about in the five star, but I, I developed a little bit more. So when we have a transgender client and they have a sexual reassignment surgery from female to male, our testicles form. What do you guys say? If a transgender client has a sexual reassignment surgery, are testicles formed? I said that the, the quick facts book for pediatrics is in the file vault. Quick facts for pediatrics. I didn't, I don't sell that book. I just give that book to you guys. All right. So transgender client, you guys need to review that topic. If you have it in five star, you need to review it. If you don't, if you don't have a quick facts, you need to get this one. The correct answer is absolutely yes. Now, during sexual reassignment, they will have a penis and testicles. However, they will not be able to produce sperm. That's very important. It was removed. Let me, I'll, I'll check it again. You saying it's not in there? It should be in there under, um, I think it's under books or resources. Okay. Here's the question. Let me ask you this. What's the question about long COVID? Put it on there again. There's a question about long COVID. Put it on there again. Okay, let me ask you this. Is gender identity and sexual identity the same thing? What do you guys say about that? Mm, did anybody ask you that today? Probably not. That's why you showed up here. <laughs> Is gender identity and sexual identity the same thing? Ooh. I see mixed answers on the screen. All right, cool. This is the clinical priority. Let me read you the answer. Gender identity is not the same as sexual identity. Gender identity is the patient's internal sense of being a man, woman, or binary. Sexual identity describes the patient's romantic, physical, and emotional attraction. All right? They're not the same thing. Hmm. Question. Here we go. When you're working with the transgender client, somebody said, I don't know. I don't know. Good. When you're working with the transgender client, do you have to tell them in advance if they have to expose their body parts? If you're working with the transgender client, do you have to tell them in advance if they have to expose their body parts? I 
I'm so glad we got this. A lot of people are saying yes. Correct answer is yes. Yes. Yes, you do. Because for the transgender client, um, exposing their body parts is a very, very sensitive. And from the research I did, it could be a traumatic act. So that yeah, is basically that's the polite thing to do for anybody. Right. Anybody. But we have to be aware as nurses. Sometimes we come in and, and like, I got to insert a catheter. You know what I mean? Um, and I, myself, as a new nurse, I did that to a man one day. I'm just reading notes. I come in and I'm like, I have to put a catheter in you, sir. And he's like, no, <laughs> like, no, like I'm not about to expose myself. But for us as nurses, we get so you know, I don't even know, I don't even know how to explain it, but we, we, we are desensitized to nudity. Okay. We are so desensitized to nudity and the same as we're desensitized to vomit and blood. It don't phase us. Like it really don't phase us. So we're studying from quick facts for NCLEX, the next gen quick facts. So transgender client is one of the topics on here. All right. So very good. All right. Let's talk about, oh, this is what I talk about let's go to this topic of let's talk about oh let's talk about active and passive immunity let's talk about active and passive immunity and i do want to go over huntington's disease because I, I talked about that all right um active immunity versus passive immunity this is oh long COVID. long COVID. Thank you for asking that question again. Long COVID is when you develop symptoms after your initial COVID infection. So if you start developing, um, like I had a little bit of long COVID. I had COVID and then like two, three months later, I was having uh, difficulty breathing. Um, and so it was a long COVID symptom, right? So that's long COVID, okay? Um, endocrine, DKA, HHNK, I do that in the V2 lecture, so you'll be able to watch that. Okay, here we go. Ooh. Vaccinations. Vaccinations. All right. <laughs> Vaccinations. Is that considered... An active immunity type or a passive immunity type? Ooh. Thanks, Tracy. Active immunity versus passive immunity. Vaccinations. Oh, I'm so glad I did this. One. Mm -mm 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 -mm. You go to the website if you want the next gen quick facts. You can go to remarnurse.com. Wait, is my mic? Can y'all still hear me? All right. So vaccinations, let me get this off here. Vaccinations are considered active immunity, active immunity. Okay. Because your body has to be active to build up that immune response. So with a vaccine, with a vaccine, they're injecting a small dose of whatever that virus is, whether it's live or attenuated, like whatever, but your body still has to combat that, um, that virus, right? So your body still has to produce a response to it. Okay, there's some good stuff in here. Ooh! What's the difference? This is in the clinical priorities. What's the difference between a vaccination and an immunization? They're not the same thing. Even though a lot of nurses working use them interchangeably, but vaccination and immunization is not the same thing. What's the difference? Mm-hmm. Ooh! 
that's good. Anybody know? Don't Google it. If you don't know, just say, you know what? Nobody's ever asked me that. And I really don't know. I really don't know. But I'm here to learn. Mm. You might know. Let me see. Let me see what I got. What comments got. Vaccination is a booster. Vaccination. Vaccine is to prevent. I thought they were the same thing. I don't know. I have no idea. Immunization means against. I don't know. I, I love y'all today. Um, I'm not sure. Vaccination shot, immunization protected. That's it. Really, that's it. Let me read the let me read the clinical priorities. Vaccination is the act of introducing. Okay, a vaccine into the person's body to protect from a specific disease. Okay, so when you vaccinate somebody, the idea is that you are putting a vaccine, a disease, something into the body, right? When a person is immunized, let me read it, let me read it so I don't mess it up. It's the process by which a person now has immunity. OK, the process by which a person becomes protected against a disease. OK, so there are many different ways that you can have immunization. Remember, OK, immunization. We just talked about it. You can have passive immunization or you can have active immunization. So if a mother through breast milk, gives her baby antibodies, that's passive immunization, right? Are we, are we together? All right. We would never say antibodies from a breast milk is vaccination. We would never say that that's vaccination because it's not. But don't we use immunization and vaccination the same thing, right? So vaccination is a form of vaccination. Clear, clearly, clearly that explains it. Okay. <laughs> um, so yes, 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 yes. All right. So these are little things, you know, little things that we as nurses, we want to be so, we want to be confident. We want, we want to not have anybody question us. We want to know our stuff so good that nobody can approach us about what we do. Okay. All right. Good job. All right. Um, all right. Was that it? Was that what I was trying to get to? I feel like I wasn't trying. I was trying to talk about something else. I didn't, I didn't almost did the whole book for y'all. Okay. I think that's it. I think that's it. I'm getting out of here. I'm getting out of here. Okay. But this is so good. Mm. Organ donation. Okay. Y'all okay. know orthostatic type of tension. We talked about this. Okay. Okay. Mark. Okay. Part two. Okay. In, in, okay. So what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to do with this is that, yes, number one, patients could ask y'all this. So period. Number one. Um, and what I'm trying to do is put a more clinical focus on are studying. Okay. Because that's what that's what's missing. And that's why I think that every Huntington's disease, thank you. You're listening to me. And that's why um, I think that now with this next gen NCLEX, people who have clinical experience or they are LPNs, right? Because y'all do a lot of clinicals, they're going to do better. They're going to do better at this exam. So if you're a repeat test taker, you might find that this is the exam you've actually been waiting for. All right. Jay Hobson, you're taking your NCLEX on April 24th. That's right around the corner. Um, um, I'm excited for you. I'm, I'm excited for you. It's a great opportunity. All right. Um, so here we go. Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is... Do you expect behavioral changes with Huntington's disease? 
Yeah. Do you expect behavioral changes with Huntington's disease? And Huntington's disease is the same as, um, it's pretty much, except for the clinical priorities, which I'll read the clinical priorities from Huntington's disease for you guys. Yes, you do. You expect, you absolutely expect clinical behavioral changes with Huntington's disease. And the thing about Huntington's disease, guys, is that it looks a lot like Parkinson's disease. It looks a lot like Parkinson's disease. So you have a patient, like, right, you have a patient with the shaky movements, the, the rigidity, the impaired gait, they fall a lot. And you would look at them and you would say, oh, that's Parkinson's disease. Okay. But the difference with Huntington's disease is that these patients will snap. They will fight you. They will become aggressive. They will become very frustrated. And you don't see that with Parkinson's disease, right? Okay. Um, and then they're young, 30 to 50 years old. So a little bit younger, okay? Um, the, the LPN exam in Canada is called the, I think it's called the Rex. It's not as, it's not the same as the NCLEX. It's close. And I think Pearson View does the Rex too, um, but it's not quite the same. Like Alzheimer's, yes, Alzheimer's patients will snap on you and they are very strong. All right, here we go. So um, is there a cure for Huntington's disease? Think about it. Is there a cure for Huntington's disease? Yes, Huntington's disease does affect, um, it does affect the nerves. It does. Is there a cure for Huntington's disease? No, 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 no. No, it's not. Will the patient with Huntington's disease experience memory loss? What do you guys think about that? We are studying from NextGen NCLEX. Uh, yes, there is treatment. And guess what kind of treatment we're going to give them? Some... There is memory loss. So there is memory loss. What type of medication do we give our patients with Huntington's to, because we know there's no treatment to control the symptoms? What kind of medication are we going to give them? Hmm? A steroid? Um. You gonna give them diazepam? Be like, we just gonna we gonna put them out. We gonna we gonna sedate them. The diazepam. Yes, there is still a calendar with the next gen quick facts. Um, I kept it at three weeks. Kept it at three weeks, so you still get through this book in three weeks. Okay, yeah, we're gonna give the anti Parkinson's medication. Yep, yep, we're gonna give the anti Parkinson's medication. That is the medication we're gonna give them. And so there are some things about um. Parkinson's disease and their medications that you need to know about generally in the class. Okay, so the clinical priorities for Huntington's disease is they may experience uh, they may experience memory loss. Violent outbursts are part of the behavioral changes in mood swing. From the time of the first symptom to death, is usually 10 to 30 years. So these patients can live a long time, all right? 10 to 30 years. Okay, this condition is often confused, which I went over this. This condition is often confused with Parkinson's disease, which also has rigidity and slow movement. However, clients with Parkinson's disease do not have the cognitive impairment seen in Huntington's disease. So there it is, case closed. That's how we know one is Huntington's and one is Parkinson's. Okay. All right, guys. Okay, guys, I am going to, we've been studying for over an hour. I'm going to do the three, the three symptoms that nursing students need to be treated for right now if they're studying for next-gen NCLEX. Really quickly, I'm just gonna give them to you. All right, number one, the first symptom is the 
the first symptom is make sure you're just studying generic names. Do not study the brand names like you do in nursing school. Once you graduate nursing school, forget that part of it. You don't need to know that for NCLEX. The second thing is that when you receive a doctor's note or nurse's note, a medication list that has one question attached to it, that is not a case study. That's not considered a case study. Case studies have six questions attached to them. Okay. So it's just a next gen type question. The third thing, follow up priorities. Follow up priorities means you want to consider what would be wrong with the patient. So if a patient says, I can inject my insulin in my arm every day, then we know our follow-up to that would be, no, you can't. You need to rotate those injection sites, okay? So when you talk about your follow-up, it means that you need to correct something, okay? So you're always thinking of what is the, uh, the adverse effect. Also, I gave the example is if the patient um, has a dressing and you just placed a new dressing on a stage three wound, you guys need to know, you guys need to definitely know dermal pressure ulcers. You need to definitely know dermal pressure ulcers. So a patient has a stage three wound and you put a dressing on it, what is your clinical priority? What is your clinical priority? What is your clinical priority? And that answer is going to be, remember we talked about it? It is going to be to check for drainage, check for bleeding. Is that dressing clean, dry, and intact when you go in there? All right. Do they count case study questions for one or are they only count them for six? They only count them for six. They only count a case study for a six block question. Okay. So um, tomorrow... I'm going to be, I think there's supposed to be like a thousand nursing students here at the National Student Nurses um, Convention. So, huh? I got, I got a thousand right now. What? So I'm going to be getting more intel on what these nursing students are thinking about next gen. And also um, I'm going to share it with y'all. I'm going to share it with y'all like, what? This is what I heard or this is what they're doing. Um, but you can get in the trial version of the V2 right now. And you can get started studying, start watching lectures. I need a lot of y'all. I need a lot of y'all to um, make that move. I want to see y'all passing. I think this is a great time. You got to remember, NCLEX is put in place to prevent somebody who is um, not at a certain educational level of passing NCLEX, okay? So they're trying to prevent you guys from going out into the workforce without appropriate clinical knowledge, okay? And so you guys have to do something to overcome. You guys have to do something to overcome this barrier. It is not a passive. It is not a passive event. It's not a passive event. And the more people that I'm in, uh, I'm able to encourage and the more people that are able to take up this challenge and say, let's get it. Let's do this. I'm able, I'm ready to do it. All right. Then the quicker you will be able to, to meet your goals. And I know you all have goals in January. I know you set those new year resolutions. I know you wanted to pass NCLEX. I know you want to get a job. I know you want to get a new house. You need a new car. You got credit card college loan, I, you got all type of, you got all type of debt, right? <laughs> so I'm going on here ferociously to encourage y'all. Let's do this. Okay. Let's do this. Um, like I said, NCLEX is there for a reason. It is a very huge challenge, but Today, I, you know, I'm, I'm meeting nursing students with amazing stories. I'm meeting nursing students that are, they, they don't know nothing about the, the past NCLEX. All they know is this, okay? 
all they know is that I need to pass next gen NCLEX. It's not a question. Some of us don't want to move forward. We, you know, we thinking about the past NCLEX. We thinking about how it could have been, how good it used to be. Those days were gone. All we got right now is today. We got past this next gen NCLEX. So somebody came on here to hear that. But for real, for real, big picture, big picture is that there is a blessing so you do, you have to say, I can, I will, I must pass NCLEX. I can, I will, I must pass NCLEX. But at the same time, you got to get up and do something about it. You know, like when Jesus healed that man at the pool of Beth uh, Bethesda, he told him, take your mat and get up, like get up. And some of us need that. We need to take our mats and we need to get up. And by just taking that first step, it will continue to give you the strength to take the first, the next one. Yeah, yeah. The first step is always the hardest. The first step is always the hardest. So, you know, take that first step. Hmm? Yeah, you want to show a lecture? Oh, wait, what, what you doing? What you doing? Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So um, I need to reset my reset my V two. Um, I'm not sure if you can reset your V two. You want to like start all over again? I'm not sure you can do that because V two creates a certificate for you when you're finished. Many nursing students need that certificate in order to um, reapply for NCLEX. All right. Um, so what's about to happen now is we are about to go into V two. All right. I'm going to show a lecture from V2 because one of the winning formulas to pass this test is not only the question bank. And I love my question bank. I love the case studies and um, the bow tie questions. I love all of that stuff. But if you don't have the knowledge, if you don't have that content, then you really are studying backwards and you're wasting time and you're going to spend more money and you're going to have to, um, you know, you will have to start all over again. Cause every time you take NCLEX, you got to start from the beginning. So what I want to do is give you guys the lecture portion of it. So you can see what the lecture is like, cause y'all know what the questions are like. Y'all know how to do questions. You go on my TikTok. I got all type of questions on there, but I want you to see the difference in the lectures and my lectures don't take all day. So get out your notebooks and let's get it done. Let's do it. Let's go. All right. Diabetes insipidus versus syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormones should really be an advanced clinical topic because most nursing students really don't know the nuances between the two. I find too that most nurses working forget how they are different. So let's start with this. Both are a problem with the antidiuretic hormone. Both are a problem with ADH. So what does the antidiuretic hormone do? Can you think about it? Let's, let's look at it like this. When you have a diuretic, what is the function of the diuretic? What does diuretics tell the body to do? They tell the body to get rid of water. So if we have something that's antidiuretic, what is it gonna tell the body to do? It's going to instruct the brain to tell the rest of the body that we are holding on to water. We are retaining fluid. So both of these conditions will be a problem with fluid in the body. Now let's look at diabetes insipidus first because we can learn a lot from just the name diabetes insipidus. So when we see the word diabetes, what do we think of? Most of you all will say we think of high blood sugar we think of hyperglycemia but that is not what diabetes means the word diabetes means a person who is putting out a lot of urine that's what it means it means a person who's putting out a lot of urine 
the term after diabetes will describe what that urine looks like. So here we have diabetes, somebody that's putting out a lot of urine, and we have insipidus. The term insipidus means clear, colorless, odorless, tasteless. Because remember, back in the day, doctors used to drink urine to determine what kind of illness a patient has. So diabetes insipidus used to be called water diabetes as well because the urine looked like water. But it is a problem with too little ADH. So you don't have the antidiuretic hormone in the proper amount telling the body to keep water. So it just puts it out. It just puts out all the fluid because there's no antidiuretic hormone there. So when you think of diabetes insipidus and the signs, the signs are severe dehydration. Yes, because somebody with diabetes insipidus has a very high increased urine output. So the urine output can actually be up to 30 liters a day, which is a lot of urine. Also, because the patient is so dehydrated, they're going to be thirsty. They're going to be complaining of thirst. Now, critically think here. Somebody with diabetes insipidus that's putting out a lot of urine, is their blood pressure going to be high or low? What do you think? Is the blood pressure going to be high or low? The blood pressure is going to be low. So what is the heart rate going to do to compensate? The heart rate is going to increase. So you will have those two vital sign changes. But look at the signs again. Do we see hyperglycemia anywhere in diabetes insipidus? Do we expect the blood sugar to be high? No, not at all. So that's why it's so important for us to study the content because on the exam, I'm telling you, hyperglycemia will be a choice there to determine if you really know what you're talking about. All right, so diabetes insipidus has nothing to do with blood sugar ranges. So what is the treatment for diabetes insipidus? What is it? Because the client does not have enough of the antidiuretic hormone, we need to supplement what is supposed to be there. So we need to give a medication that's going to act like the antidiuretic hormone. Do you know what that medication is? It is vasopressin, vasopressin. Yes, vasopressin tells the body to hold on to water. It's really good to also improve low blood pressure. So if you plan to work in the ICU where patients have problems maintaining their blood pressure, vasopressin will be a very popular medication for you. Now that you understand when you have too little ADH, let's look at syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone where you have too much of that antidiuretic hormone. You have way too much. So it is telling the body that we're going to save all of the water that we have. We're not gonna put out any fluids. <laughs> so the signs of SIADH are fluid overload. Of course, fluid overload. Also, oliguria. Oliguria is very little urine output. Because the client has an increased fluid intake or fluid overload, talk to me about their sodium level. Will the sodium level be up or down? We would expect that sodium level to go down because of the fluid overload in SIADH. Now with diabetes insipidus, we would expect that sodium level to be way high because the patient is dehydrated. But here, low sodium level. So with the low sodium level, we're also going to see a client that is confused. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you guys know the condition, SIADH now. Tell me the treatment. What is the treatment for somebody who has too much fluid in their body? What are we going to give them? We're going to give them diuretics. Yes, we're going to give them diuretics. And specifically, the osmotic class of diuretics is going to be best because that's going to help pull water off of the brain too as well. Also, we definitely would want to put these clients on fluid restrictions. 
So you have this whole page filled out and now you understand the difference between diabetes insipidus and SIADH. Thank you for studying with Remar. We're gonna keep making it simple for you guys. Uh, and we're moving on to the next topic. Okay, so my whole goal for y'all watching that is to see how easy it is for you to learn the content that you need to know for next-gen NCLEX. Now you know the difference between diabetes insipidus, you know not to check blood glucose levels, right? And syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. These are the types of differences that make a clinical exam so much easier, right? And it does not require you to read paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of a fundamentals of nursing book. So I want you to be ready for next gen as, as fast as possible, okay? That means that I have to be very clear and very direct about what's important. So that's what I do in V2. If you have V2, you will find these lectures under the NCLEX review. Okay. You have it. Ah, very good. So remember, V2 is an online platform. All right. So when you first get, even if you get into the trial, you're going to see two squares. You're going to see myself if you click this square this is where all of the lectures are going to come if you see this lady here then you are in the 30-day challenge so you're just going to see challenge videos which are not the same as the lecture videos so when you get in v2 right you click on my face and then this is where you're going to see all of my lectures okay all of my lectures, and they will all be in that amazing straight to the point for format for you guys so that you're learning at the same time. Okay. This is what it takes to be, this is what it takes to be prepared for your nursing licensure exam. Don't just be in a question bank doing questions and you have not reviewed that material. Okay. Y'all know when I brought the people on the past next gen NCLEX, what did they say? They said that they were number one repeat test, test takers. They did not have the connection. It's different when you have a, a bunch of random facts, but you really need the connection to those facts so that you can see the entire picture. Okay. And so V2 will help you. The lectures will help you see the entire picture in a quick way. OK, it will help you see the entire picture in a quick way. And the videos are are really cool. Like they're not boring videos. I, that was another point. I don't need y'all zoning out. I need y'all to be engaged into the information because then you don't have to study as long. But when you distract it and you like, what is she talking about? You're not going to stay. And I need you to stay. I need you to give me four Four weeks. Some people are doing the program in two weeks. I'm asking for four weeks in order for you to be ready. Okay. And that's including what you do in the question bank. So lectures first, then question bank. Okay. Then computer adaptive exam. But um, the last person I brought on said she didn't even do the computer adaptive exam. Okay. How, how do I get your VT? Okay. The V, the v, I'm sorry, the V2. The V2 is at remarnurse.com. Okay. And this is a better NCLEX review. I, I, honestly, I'll tell you guys, it's a better NCLEX review because it comes with the question bank. All right. My original program did not come with the question bank. It just came with the lectures, which were really good. And it didn't have the, um, it didn't have the question bank at all. Oh, all right. If you forgot your password to V2, just click on the forgot my password. Okay. All right. So again, it's all about using something that's going to help cover you the best. All right. 
All right, guys. So um, I have been on here for long enough. Let me just encourage you. Um, if you have not, if you have not experienced my V2, go to remarnurse.com and get in the trial. In the trial, you'll be able to watch lectures. In the trial version of the V2, you'll be able to do a case study. You'll be able to do, these are next-gen question types. This is a single choice matrix, okay? This is a single choice matrix question. Um, and so these types of things, you will be able to put your hands on and see the difference. But for me, it's the lectures. Uh, it's the lectures for me. Like nobody got anything on my lectures. And I, you know, I don't say a lot of stuff, you know, to brag or whatever, but the lectures are going to help you learn information in a very fast way, very fast. So if time is of the essence and you need to get something done quickly, V2, V2 is designed to do that. All right. So um, I will see you guys later. I will see you guys later. Winning Wednesday has been done. I do this every Monday. I do this every Wednesday. Okay, Monday, Monday at noon, uh, Eastern Standard Time, and then Wednesday, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is usually where I am. Even if I'm in a different place like Nashville, man, I'm still going to come on. Okay, so I will see you guys on tonight. Uh, I'll see you guys maybe tomorrow. I'll, I'll go live from the Nursing Student Convention. I will. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that you get the notifications right now. Is it 1030 right now? What time is it? Oh, wait, is it 930 here or 1030? Okay, there's this, there's this party, nurse and student convention. I want to go down there and do like the cha-cha slide or something. But since we in Nashville, it was like you dress up as a cowboy. I'm going as Remar. I don't have no cowboy stuff. So that's what I'm about to do. It's 1025 Eastern time, right? So it's 925 here. Okay, so this party about to end, guys. So let me go down here, kick it with these nursing students and have a great time. I hope you enjoyed the study session. It was free. So that's the best part about it, right? And we got to cover some new topics uh, from the Next Gen Quick Facts and you guys learned a lot. All right, the nursing student convention um, is thir uh, we uh Thursday through sat Saturday, Sunday, Sunday. All right. So I'm going to be there. No, Saturday. I'm going to be there Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Okay. So I will see you. if you're in Nashville, come check me out. If not, I'm going to be around, around town somewhere. Okay. All right, guys. I will see you later. Bye -bye.